Okay, we're recording. Please go ahead. Okay. So for those of you that are joining us for the first time, the budget coordinating group is in fact created, it was actually existed before this charter uh, in a much more informal kind of way, uh, but it now is part of our charter and it has representatives from the town, the school and the library. And it also has a representative from the regional school committee, which is um, we have today. So with that, I would like to um, call the meeting to order. Two seconds. Um, if I can, Lynn, Dr. Z will be here in a few minutes. Okay, shall we wait? Since she's never been to one, Paul? Sure, yes. Okay. And while we wait, I can thank everybody who made the effort to be at Chris, Chris Breastrup's retirement event this afternoon. That was really kind. There are a lot of people you know, a lot of elected officials, appointed officials, and past staff members and current staff members who were there. She really deserved everybody who came out. So it thank was you really all. nice. Very nice. Thanks for those of you in the audience for your patience. We're, um, waiting for the superintendent. So we can dispose of the minutes. Those are on the agenda and I don't need a vote. I just need consensus that those are acceptable okay. and there are no changes. Are there any, uh, let me, well, let me call the meeting to order. Okay. Oh, thank you. And then, we'll, then we'll do that. Uh, so let's start. We're recording. Okay. Um, first of all, it is September 26th. Uh, this is our first meeting of the budget coordinating group during this fiscal year. The open meeting law allows us to, to hold meetings remotely without a quorum of all of us present uh, in the room. And, but we still do taping of this and people can come and join us by Zoom. Um, given that we have a quorum of this group present, I'm calling the budget coordinating group to order at 4.08. I wanna call on each of you and make sure you can hear us and we can hear you from the town, Andy Steinberg. Uh, Andy, you need to unmute. Mandy Joe, how about you? Present. Okay, thank you. Uh, from the library, Austin Surratt. Present. And Nat. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. And from the elementary school district, Bridget. Yes, here. And Herb? Present. And uh, from the regional school, um, Tillman? Present. Okay. And then we have Dr. Herman, who is the superintendent of schools. Can you hear us? Well, we'll wait. Uh, Paul Blockman, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay, we have a couple of different staff. Our new fiscal director of Fis fiscal, um, Melissa Zawadzki. Did I get it right? You got it right. Okay. <laughs> uh, Holly Drake and Jennifer LaFontaine. LaFountain. LaFountain. I, La I knew That's the minute okay. I said it. Um, so with that, we're going to um, get started if you, there is no chat in this, we do have an audience because it is an open meeting. And uh, our first item on the agenda, besides um, calling the meeting to order, is um, 
to uh, hear the status of the FY25 budgets. Uh, and this is, so Paul, do you want to introduce this and then get started? Sure. Thank you everybody for being here. Um, so what we have today is sort of just give you a, an update on the FY25 budget, which is, um, um, we will sort of a little talk, little talk about, you know, FY24 isn't even car cut out, isn't, isn't finished yet. Um, so we don't know how that year has, has completed, but we're very close to complete closing out the books on, on that account. And then for FY25, uh, we can give you a status of where we are. It's very early in the year. This is the, one of the earliest times we've had the BCG meeting. So there's not a lot of data that we can share, but Holly can give a quick overview of sort of general comments on the FY25 budget. Yeah, um, you know, as Paul said, I am working diligently to close out FY24. I am very, very close. I am uh, pretty much in balance, just trying to get everything into the state's um, website for final reporting. Um, FY25 at this point is, you know, status quo for the first quarter. Uh, numbers are where I would expect them to be. They're they're does not appear to be any, um, you know, big surprises coming yet. So I, I think that, um, you know, FY25 is um, just started and, and rolling along and th there's not really a lot to say about it at this point. So Paul, we're going to, and just for those of you that are not as familiar with the budget uh, cycles, Somewhere around the end of October, the beginning of November, we do have a certification on the FY24 budget, and that will come to the council. All of that usually is in our first meeting in November. And in fact, the BCG will meet as a body in November when all three of the boards uh, meet. And Tillman, you're welcome to join us as well. That will be for the financial indicators. Uh, so, um, we have some initial projections. Paul, do you want to introduce that? Sure. So what we're used to showing a spreadsheet, which we'll put up on the screen, uh, that will um, is something that most people have seen before. And it's, you know, again, we're sort of, we can, we've updated for what the budget is for FY25. But again, there's not a lot of projections or new numbers yet. It's way too early. Um, and we can talk about some of the drivers when we get to our um the next agenda item. So, and I think Melissa, did you want to walk through it, or how do you, how would you like to do that? So, and so, I'll, I'll just frame it, okay? So, the the first page, there's two pages. The first pages could we, are. Could we make it a little bit larger? Thank you. The first page is our, our revenues, and we we have the a very detailed. We'll, we're have, going to have a broad overview of this. The, it reads left to right with FY22 actual, FY23, FY24, and then FY25 is the budget that's been approved. And then FY26 is really what we're focused on with this group. And then we project out three additional years um, just with some basic factors in a, um, on that. So we really wanna focus on FY26 because that's gonna be the subject of the budget that's upcoming. Uh, the second page shows our expenses. So, and so then we have a balance at the bottom. And this is a document that you'll see over and over uh, during the course of the year. It's something that we rely on and that we, we show. So, um, Melissa, you you updated this. Do you want to sort of walk through it? So we'll go first back to the first page, I think. Yep. So, um, uh, like Paul said, I haven't really updated any of our uh, assumptions. All I um, really um, did um, as a change from what was published in uh, the fiscal 25 budget based on the indicators that were done um, last October, November. Um, and that those are the numbers that we use to project forward. And the only thing that I added from this that's different from the budget is the acknowledgement of the um, additional funding that went to the school department. And it is shown um, highlighted because it is the only change um, as the um, additional 2% as both the revenue and the expense, um, because in when we presented the uh, fiscal 25 budget, um, it, it was not included in the original um, proposed budget. It was um, done sometime in your, in your process there. Um, so the way that this uh, spreadsheet is put together, it, it starts with um, 
tax revenue. Um, so, you know, for those of you who aren't familiar, we have our base tax revenue, which is based on last year's taxable revenue, the allowance for two and a half percent increase over the prior year. And then we're allowed to include any new growth that, um, that we project coming in the new year. Amherst has a, a practice of estimating about $650,000 of new growth. We're continuing that practice um, because some years it's much higher and some years it's you know, close and maybe lower um, on a, in an anomaly year. Um, and uh, in this uh, fiscal 25 and 26 budget and future years, we have a debt exclusion, which we hadn't had in, um, recent past, um, and that is for the new uh, school project. So that gets added on after you establish the two and a half percent. And the overall increase in the tax revenue is slightly over 3%. And that's based on new growth. That's because of the new growth and because of the additional um, increase of um, <clears throat> the uh, debt excluded project. Uh, next, we have um, local receipts, which this is fees, motor vehicle tax, um, excise tax from hotel, motel. Um, we have some agreements with some of our nonprofits in town, um, housing authorities and such, um, a solar um, <clears throat> pilot agreement, and permits for um, building a deck or putting in a pool or or other things. So anything that we charge a fee for, um, that's estimated at about a one percent increase, um, and you know that that could go up, but it's generally in the early stages before we have a look at what happened last year. We um, estimate it pretty conservatively because we don't want to um, assume any one area is going to go higher than the other, and we always have to sort of. Um, project that pretty closely to um, what has happened over the past uh, few years. Um, then we have state aid, uh, state aid numbers they have put in there with a modest increase. We won't, haven't gotten any information from the state yet on what their fiscal 26 will look like and we'll adjust that as we get information from the state. Um, and other financing sources, this is when we, um, we put money into the budget to um, we have an ambulance fund, so we put money in um, from that to help um, offset the capital costs of uh, ambulance purchases. I'm, uh, the CPA is an addition uh, on your tax bill that is separate from two and a half that is for special projects, and we include in this spreadsheet the CPA um, amounts that are funding debt that we issued um, that is uh, approved by the CPA. Um, we, as you know, we have enterprise funds here um, and water, sewer, and um, transportation and solid waste. Those enterprise have subsidized or pay a portion of general fund um, staff in the way that we support um, their operations. We do their payroll um, or, or um, a, a billing that kind of thing, mm -hmm. they pay, that portion of their salary is general fund and also uh, the DPW departments, um, you know, the director has, highway is, is a general fund operation, whereas water and sewer are not. So the director is over all of those. And so some of those administrative staff are shared. Um, and then there are other um, free cash and stabilization time signs go into other financing sources, uh, one-time monies type of uh, transactions, similar to this ARPA grant that I put in as other because I didn't know how else to classify it. On the expense side, we just break it down into the um, four major categories, uh, town, elementary school, region school, and the Jones Library um, as our primary operating expenses. Then we have our capital budgets, um, which is basically debt and cash for capital. We have a few of these broken up based on whether or not it's um, debt excluded for the region, if it's a current project that we've already borrowed for, or if it's something that we are projecting. Amherst has a policy of spending um, the 10.5%. 
of the tax levy on um, capital projects to maintain our infrastructure and um, support operations. So um, we always make sure that the cash capital and the debt um, sort of come out to that that 10% to stay within our policy and um, good finance fiscal planning. Um, and then we have um, what's categorized here as miscellaneous assessments. And these can be um, tough because um, one of them is uh, the retirement assessment. Last year, um, we didn't have a very um, big increase in the retirement assessment. Um, and um, so this year we are expecting that that might, might pop up again. That's um, something for us to watch um, to see if, um, if, if we will, uh, if we have budgeted enough for that. So we'll get that information from them. Is it in January, Jen, that we get the um, assessment information from the retirement? Um, yes, sometime around January. Okay. And then, um, if I'm I, sorry. If I just may for one mm -hmm. second, Melissa. Um, mm -hmm. So we typically budget anywhere from a six to 8% increase in the um, retirement assessment. I believe this is set at a 6% increase. Last year we saw um, almost no increase whatsoever. Um, I believe this is a 6% increase is our, our norm that we're going back to. Yeah, and, and would you agree, um, Holly, that we talked about that it might be more than sick because last year was low. We're sort of um, anticipating that there might be a an increase there, but we don't know yet. It so that's why we have a possibility. But yes, we we do not we will not know that for a few more months. Um, the the way the retirement assessment works, just so um, folks know, is they do a snapshot in time, and that snapshot in time will be. Um, September 30th, everybody that we have on payroll as of September 30th and what we project their annual um, salary will be is how the retirement board assesses each one of the cities and towns in the Hampshire County retirement system. So depending on, um, you know, salaries at that time and vacancies at that time, that number could be higher or lower if every single seat in the towns um, is, is full our assessment is going to be higher. If we have a lot of vacancies on September 30th, um, it it could possibly be lower, which was the case last year. But we don't have a ton of vacancies this year as we had in the prior year. So I would suspect that would be at the 6 to 8% increase as it normally is. Yes. Ron, can we just confirm Councillor Lord can hear and be heard, please? Hi. Uh, Hala, can you hear us? Yes, thank you. I can hear you. Can you hear me? I, we can. And Dr. Herman, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so that's the retirement assessment. Um, again, we haven't changed assumptions, um, but it's something for us to watch. Um, and then we have the um, OPEB that we um, have a practice of increasing by $50,000 a year. So that... Um, increases in this um, miscellaneous. And then the fa uh, final section of the expenses is um, what's called unappropriate uses. And that's because they're not actually appropriated in the budget per se. So um, there are several um, assessments that come from the, um, the state um, that are netted from our um, local receipts. So we have to recognize them and understand the uh, net amount that will the town will receive for um, for for local aid. Okay. Um. So the, just Linda, the, the, so the net result we're showing at this point is about a $468,000 deficit, which is not unusual at this time of year because our our estimates are very conservative on both revenue and on uh, expenditures and there's with expenditures we you know we have been conservative at a two and a half percent increase and also just to note you know that the we have not included the three hundred fifty five thousand that the additional two percent that was given to the schools last year from from ARPA funds in this and I know that that's going to be a point of conversation probably today is at least the first conversation on that as well. So this is an opportunity to ask questions about 
our revenue and expenditures and in the broad way that you're presently seeing it. Uh, we This may or may not be the same amount, same presentation that we base the um, November 4th meeting on uh, in when we do the financial indicators. But uh, hopefully, although last year things got a little rocky with the state, it gets a little bit better. But again, as I mentioned last year, the state actually did mid-year rescissions, but it didn't hit education. It hit mostly nonprofits. Um, Paul, is there anything you want to highlight on this? Are there other are there people who have questions or would like clarification? Please use the raise hand button. Irv, please go ahead. All right. I am looking at the uh, region number of 89449700. And Paul, you just said something that that is our final number that we had, uh, but it does not include the gift. So, so if that's in FY25, it was 18482898 plus 355440. So what we are projecting for this year is we did a two and a half inflate, uh, increase over the original appropriation, which was the 18482, and, and that brings it to 18944. So... Um, so it, it, it's, it's about level from what you are, have now. Does right. that make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, just, just, I just want to clarify, uh, the region received a 300 plus thousand dollar gift. Uh, and I'm just wanting to know whether that 18944970 represents that gift. And that is the base that this is projected on it does not include it does not represent that this would be just a normal two and a half percent increase without the gift without the gift yes yeah. all right thank you and i think and just if i can so just if we want to be as transparent and clear about what we're presenting we know this is the first conversation so just want to be really clear about what's on the table here thank you bridget Hi, I just had a couple of questions. Um, is the three percent um that's um the actual new growth, or does it include that, or is it that assumed amount of six hundred and fifty thousand? That was my first question. If we can go back up to that first sheet. Yeah. So the the six hundred and fifty thousand is um an assumed amount. So do we know the actual um, growth for the year or no? No, that's um, that's done at, at recap time. So, okay. so, so this is for the year that we're in. Um, the oh. FY25 is for the year we, we are in. Okay, mm -hmm. great. And then um, the other question I had was um, just if we know how much is like, is there money available left in free cash or is free cash, is it the same deal? We won't know until all the funds go back in. And so the free cash number would be for 24, but I didn't see a number there either. Mm -hmm. um, so the free cash hasn't been certified yet. So we're, we're waiting on that. So Holly is working on the free cash. We will get that certified hopefully before our November meetings so you'll we'll know what free cash is for this year um before you know or within the next month or so all right is that, perfect. Is, is, that right. is that holly anything else you want to add to that yeah so with free cash free cash is certified um typically in the fall after all of your year end um reports are filed and then you can choose to appropriate from free cash we did appropriate from free cash for some things um mostly moving to our um stabilization funds, you know, per our financial policy in FY24. These FY24 numbers will be updated and finalized. Um, they are balanced to what is called the recap. They are balanced, but they they do not reflect any changes or um, transfers from free cash, I don't believe, yet. 
Um, again, what will happen in FY25 is as soon as our free cash is certified, we will follow our financial policies likely and move money into stabilization funds and capital stabilization funds and possibly appropriate money out of free cash in FY25. When it comes to FY26, that's we have no idea what our free cash will be a year from now. So in our FY26, we can't project anything. We could have zero free cash or we could have plenty of free cash, but we don't make any assumptions on that this far ahead. Yeah, no, if that helps or makes sense. No, it's perfect. I just feel okay. like last time we went through, I saw a number of like 9 million and I was like, wait, where'd that go? What's going on? But I, I see that you're working on those 24 numbers. Again. Right. Those 24 numbers have been, we did appropriate some money out of the free cash. 9 million was a starting number of our free cash, but that's not what the final, again, has People have told me many a times over the year, it's not cash and it's not free. It's basically, <laughs> it, it's a very funny um, label calculation. <laughs> Thanks, right. Holly. Uh, Dr. Herman, you have your hand up. I do. So um, looking through my lens at 355, 440, you said it was, it's now projected as both revenue and expense. So it kind of, um balances itself off like a, a, a net zero mm -hmm. yes that's true okay and then for the projections for fy26 and i can't help but look at that lens in terms of the expenses for the town we are we've written back minus the two but is there a consideration of how to keep that 355 40 in for the region for the upcoming year I think that's sort of the topic of, you know, I think the, the school committee and you will say we want that money. Um, and I think this town council and, and town sort of said that was one time money when it happened. It was, it was understood to be one time money. But, it, you know, I, I, that's what this conversation is going to be about. Okay. And how is school choice a revenue? I, just for my ignorance, because I'm not sure. How is it a revenue for the town? Because it's a major expense for the region. Those are the people that choice in is my understanding. Is that correct, Paul? So who's who wants to take on explaining how choice is calculated? <laughs> well, <let's... laughs> so, so well, choice is counted uh, calculated by by pupil, and right. you have choice in and choice out. So, um, I will say that choice is is recognized as revenue um, in the town budget, but um, I believe that you have school choice um, in the region um, as well. That is, um, it's called an offset. See how it says offset receipt above um, school choice in Sioux Library. library. So the, that money is counted and then also as part of uh, an offset to only be used for schools. So um, you should probably have on your books um, at the region, something called the ch ch school choice account. And that is your mm -hmm. choice money in for students that are coming in from out of district and choosing Amherst schools as a preference, um, you know, either from Hadley or Northampton or um, Hatfield. Um, and Typically what I've seen in other communities, and I can't speak to how it is here, but that's usually used as a, um, an account um, in the school departments mm -hmm. to stabilize their budgets. Right, a revolving fund. I'm yeah. just trying, I'm, I'm trying to, to, to wrap, wrap my mind around it. So thank you for that. I might so have if, I, if I can mm -hmm. maybe help explain a, a little bit more is, those two offset receipts that you see in the yellow column for FY26 that are um, projected at the same as last year, the 708, 951, 
for the school choice tuition and then the public libraries, 151, that comes to $860,000. That money goes directly to the schools and directly to the public library. So if you scroll down to the expense side, you will see that as an expense as well. The second, yep, yeah, right there, that 867.39 comes into the town and then goes directly back out. So it has a net zero effect on our budget. It does not help us. It is for the schools and the libraries. Okay. But I, but I think also what you're asking about something in here where it says state assessments, this 3 million. Oh, okay. Uh, most of that is choice and charter out. Right. And so that's what you're, you know, I hear your concern. <laughs> okay. That's, I, I'm okay. Cause I don't see it as a gain, but I thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Councillor Haneke. Yeah, on that conversation, I guess from a council point of view, I just want to sort of put my the lens I look at that in. And all if you look at all the state aid, chapter 70 is also listed here, um, which is school, school state aid. Um, and I've always thought of it as the elementary school state aid, as well as the element, uh, as well as the unrestricted government state aid for municipalities and all comes in and is listed on this budget. Um, and then, you know, chapter 70 was barely over 1% government for FY25, unrestricted government aid was about 3%, I think that last year, mm -hmm. Correct. um, all of that gets into our total revenues. And then we, the way I look at it is we then split those total revenues up between the four entities, one of which is the elementary school full budget. That that for the FY twenty five the twenty six nine is I believe your total budget um, minus revolving funds. The town's twenty eight is the municipal operating. The region is not the total; it's just Amherst assessment. But the way I've looked at it as by putting it into our budgets and not um, for the elementary school, not having that pulled out and and not included in say this budget. Um, the elementary school budget gets the benefit of the increase in unrestricted government aid that is above the increase in chapter 70, where, you know, that, that, that 1% low chapter 70 is split out actually amongst all four operating lines, all four major operating lines, because it's included in this budget is another way I, I guess I look at it. Um, so when UGA is high and chapter 70 is low all four major town major things split that difference and benefit from a high aga and detriment from a low chapter 70 so that the low chapter 70 is not borne by just the elementary school budget the way i've started looking at it is on finance because it's included in this full budget line instead of pulling out the school aid from what a sort of the elementary school gets from the overall budget. That's are there other questions? Yeah, are there, that is, um, so each, in other words, each of us gets some level of state age, library schools and um, the a town, and depending on who's getting a higher percent, the others benefit from that percentage. Uh, is there a any other qu clarifying questions? Okay, then I'm going to um, go to the next item on our agenda, which is to go around the table and talk about our challenges by, if you will, segment. Uh, for FY25 and beyond. And we'll start with the regional schools, then go to the elementary schools, the library and the town. Uh, so uh, with the regional schools, uh, all of you that are here from the schools serve on the regional school district uh, committee. And we also have Dr. Z. So uh, are there anybody who wants to take the lead on the challenges with regard to the regional school? I, I would um, defer to Dr. Z going and then uh, other members uh, of the schools can go. Thank you. 
Um, I think I started off with my major challenge. Um, critically at the regional school, it with the 355 40 440 being a one-time consideration, um, which would revert, and we've done our numbers minus the two percent, and we increase by just two point five percent. We would be operating at about a two point six million dollar deficit. Um, that can equate to up to thirty five positions. Um, what I met with my team today, um, and we passed through actually the past couple of days, is what are the possible scenarios um, of how the region can look in the wake of cuts. It's it's going to be a cut. It's either going to be 2.6 or it can be 1.8. So um, for, for us, one of the major challenges at the region is one, trying to create a picture of what the region would look like with the without the 355-40 and um, creating a realistic budget or a realistic programming to meet the basic needs of our students with what we are possibly faced with. So that's the region. Okay. Uh, did you, what, as, are there other people from the regional school committee who would like to speak? Tillman. Yes, thank you. Um, so I think there's a, there's a fundamental challenge that the region and probably the other schools have too, that um, with an assumed increase of 2.5 year over year, the, um, the gap between how much the state covers and how much the town's contribution cover widens. And basically the 2.5 are not making up for the cost of living increases or the, the inflationary increases of the school budget. So if we take a year over year level services budget, um, those come out to be 6%. Similar to, you know, how, for example, the, um, the retirement fund that you mentioned earlier, right? They're also not adhering to the two point five because it's just more expensive, and and I think we see the same in the in the school. Now the the state aid is I forget maybe forty percent of the overall budget, but that has been pretty level over the years, which means that cost of living increase is all something that the towns need to cover, and if the towns don't, then that leads to cuts year after year after year. And so there's um there's something fundamentally unsustainable in the way the the budgets are handled and the 2.5% allowable increase I think is at the core of that challenge. And so at some point, maybe not today but in the future I want to talk a little bit more about why that is a starting point for um units that are structurally different and cannot sustain that in that low increase um without making cut after cut after cut are there other people from the regional school committee that would mean anybody from the school committee uh bridget yeah i guess um we were all there when we had um tracy novick in from the state and she said one of the state assumptions is that we go according to municipal growth index. So that's just interesting to me because, you know, that falls above the 2.5, but we don't know what that number is really right at the moment with the 650 assumed figure. So that's just a technicality, I guess. The other thing that I found interesting from that presentation was like, given the SOA, like one of the principles underlying that is that our town has more means to fill the gap in one dimension in terms of the income available from, you know, the residents in the town, but in another dimension, because we're losing students, they hold us harmless and they give us more state money. So I think the, the piece that I sort of take away from that is like, it's a complex 
thing, but they put some of the onus back on the town, which fair or unfair, that's sort of the situation that we're in. And um, out of that, I think we just have to look that we're in this context. We've had 20 years of cuts in the regional schools, 35% of the teaching staff since 2003. And so if we're looking at either of these numbers, 1.8 million in cuts or 2.6, I'm just, again, afraid we're going to be in this situation of a downward spiral where we're providing not the best, you know, we're not the best, not even not the best, but just a mediocre education and more and more people leave our schools. The types of cuts we're looking at is just basic core classes we wouldn't be able to offer. Maybe students would have to take them online or something else. And I'm in some schools where that happens right now. And frankly, oftentimes it just doesn't qualify as education. So I'm concerned. I'm concerned of these discussions. I understand budgets you know, have their limits, but I also just worry that I feel like we really need to think early on about how we're going to support the schools. Irv, you still have your hand up? I just raised it, but I just wanted to weigh in and turn to the region. It's really concerning to me about the projections that uh, uh, Dr. Z presented, uh, the 2.5 million projected cut, uh, which um, from my, my perspective, uh, if we uh, at, at a minimum went back and uh, added that um, gift uh, to our projection and made that our base going forward for 26, that that would still mean that we would have some cuts uh, about, about the magnitude about 1.8, I believe. So what I, I know that uh, I believe that the school committee, the region will be asking for uh, that base to be, uh, to include the 350,000 whatever uh, gift as we go forward to, uh, to mitigate against the $2.5 million projected cut. That is something I know that we are going to be asking for and we might as well put that on the table now. Okay. Are there anybody, is there anybody else from the school committee that would like to speak before I call on other people? Okay. Mandy Jo, you had, I mean, Councillor Haneke, you had your hand up. Thank you. Um, I just had a, I have multiple questions, but I had one question that I'm hoping Dr. Z can um, explain to me. Um, in in her comments, she said that the cut they've projected would either be 2.6 million or 1.8 million. And the 1.8, which is a decrease of $800,000, is if the 355 is added back in. But 355 is not close to 800,000. So I guess my math is not com computing. Could you hopefully explain how adding 355,000 back in, that ARPA money back in, results in $800,000 less of a deficit instead of just $355,000 less of a deficit? Sure. Sure. Um, two things we took into consideration. One, we put back in the 2% for all towns. Um, the 2.6 million that I presented and, and I, when I presented it to the school committee, um, I thought it was just if we had removed the 2% from Amherst and Pelham from the base, but it's actually we removed the 2% from all four towns on the base. Um, and so if we remove the 2% from all four towns and then just increase a 2.5%, then we would be at a 2.6% million dollar deficit. However, if we kept the 2% from all four towns and increased, I believe again to 2.5%, we'll still be at a 1.8% deficit. Knowing that this year, we're also looking at the fact that we are entering in APEA negotiations um, and they're going to be looking for um, their COLA. Uh, what we have projected right now, we're trying to hold steady to is like a 2.5%. Hola, and that's where we're projecting out, and as well as our transportation RFP goes out this year. Okay, thank so you. So it's it's based on the region as the total. Thank yes. you. That, that, that does clarify that. Andy, you're you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, no, I appreciate the um, 
challenged that the, the were being described from the regional schools. And uh, I think that it's sort of this ongoing problem that I think we're going to have to talk about also at Fort Town meetings because that's for, it's a Fort Town dialogue that needs to happen also. But the reality is, is that ultimately, and those of us who've been dealing with municipal finance for a long time, um, have lived it for many years, is that we have the 2.5% cap that has been in place since 1980. Uh, and uh, that without an override, you can't, um, or new growth, that you're limited in the largest um, source of revenue for municipalities by two and a half percent. Um, last year, uh, we all know what happened when I've talked to, when I've looked into the question of why were Chisbury and Leverett able to come into a Fort Town meeting fairly late in the process and um, offer a larger amount, in part was because of uh, the fact, and this gets into the weeds of uh, two and a half, but um, they did not in prior years always um, have a budget that was using the full amount of their tax levy limit, which is what the limit is that you're um, given by the two and a half legislation. And um, so that when you, um, in a given year, if you choose not to increase by two and a half percent, you have the right to come back in future years and tax to that additional amount without going for an override. Um, Amherst um, is under more pressure for varieties of reasons. And uh, so we are always very close to two and a half or at two and a half percent, and we have no excess uh, in our levy limit. Um, but, you know, we have to, we have to live with the uh, realities that we deal with. And of course, the other thing that has happened in recent years is that uh, and we all know that the Student Opportunity Act has created this problem for districts like ours. Um, and that's both regional and local that um, we've been getting far less of an increase than we had been receiving in prior years in Chapter 70 aid, and that that's going to last until the legislature does something different or the Student Opportunity Act is fully funded, which is still the way. Um, and the last thing that I just wanted to let you know is that uh, as uh, one of the people who's able to be on the Fiscal Policy Committee of the MMA, these are issues that we talk about all of the time because they affect every city and town in the Commonwealth. It uh, obviously affects those of us who are not Student Opportunity Act uh, communities greater, but it is affecting everybody and we are trying to present that as part of our package to the legislature as I know the super, uh, the school committee association uh, superintendents uh, are also presenting the same request to the legislature uh, and we just have to keep at it. So that's uh, the, the reality that I just want to put out there. And, and just one tagline on to that, uh, as much as Joe Comerford, our senator, uh, tried very hard to take the commissioner of education, I mean, the secretary of education up on the promise to look at chapter 70 when that was at one point in the budget discussions, it did not make it into the, the commission to do that did not make it into the final budget. So there is not a study at this point labeled for Chapter 70 like we had hoped there would be. Are there other comments on the regional schools? 
then let's go. Uh, yes, Bridget. Just really quickly, I'm wondering if in the pilot numbers included, I want Holly um, put here, if there's UMass's new agreement included in the pilot, and then as sort of a follow up on that, the region, um, you know, the region isn't included in that, like as a separate municipal entity. So like, I'm just wondering if that's something, you know, I think we have to look at any and all sources of revenue, you know, and so each place we can go to. So I'm just wondering if those numbers are here and if there was any discussion of that regarding the region or not that I'm not privy to. Can I just clarify, because there's there there's actually the region, the agreement we have with the University of Massachusetts. That's one thing. In addition to that, state land does produce a pilot amount of pilot money. And I am assuming that if any of the other towns have state land, and I believe they do, uh, they actually get the pilot money and that would be part of their overall revenue. So Paul, I think it's the really, the question in this case really focuses on the UMass agreement. Yeah, so there's two different things, as, as Lynn said, the pilot is one thing, but I think you might be talking about, Bridget, the strategic partnership agreement, and the in the and the schools do get money directly from that, from the university for that amount. I don't have the number off the top of my head. I can send you that agreement, but it's spelled out in the agreement on how much money the schools get, and I, that does not hit our books, I believe, Holly. I think that goes directly to the schools. Holly? Um, yes, I believe the UMass Strategic Partnership goes into a revolving fund in the elementary schools, and then um, other parts of it um, mainly used for uh, funding our uh, fire department ambulance yeah. CMS services. Yeah. The and the uh, you and the, the Amherst. Pilot. Yeah, go I'm ahead. Sorry. Go ahead, Lynn. Uh, the pilot is something that is set by the state. We cannot, we we can't get more money out of the pilot. That is that is a payment in lieu of taxes that is calculated by the state. That is nothing that we have control over. The strategic partnership is what we have negotiated, um, you know, with UMass, and that's I believe, like I said, what you were. Everybody says what you. I think we are referring to. It is. I uh, just would say yeah. just a quick follow up is yeah. that. I know some other towns like us, like UMass Dartmouth towns, towns with a lot of state land, were looking for something different from the state legislature in that also this year, but they didn't get it. So we've actually joined in that fight. Um, we've I can share testimony where we've testified on behalf of both the state land pilot and also the pro the pilot that would essentially tax uh, nonprofits which would be public higher, pu private higher ed institutions, medical institutions, and other nonprofits. In that case, probably only nonprofits that are over a million dollars in worth. So I, we've, I, just, we've yeah. worked very hard to try to get them to look at not just the land that UMass has, but what's on that land and all the people that come to it and they don't do it. It's disgusting. Thank you. Uh, Paul, it's just the strategic partnership agreement has two hundred thousand dollars a year for the schools that goes to the schools, and the schools can allocate that as they see fit. Right, and the Amherst College, I believe, this year was a hundred thousand, and it went to the um, family center. Is that what I is that correct? That was a separate, I'm not sure exactly what the schools got that, from them. That, that wasn't any agreement we have at this point. No. Are there other uh, comments about the regional budget or questions? Okay, then let's look at the elementary school. And uh, let's, um, it's the, still the, the goal is to talk about our challenges in the coming year and going forward. Do we want to start with Dr. Herman? She did. She may be just. She may have another call going on. Um, Bridget or Irv, um, elementary school. I, I, honestly, as of this time, we really haven't put forth any projected budget for the elementary schools. 
Uh, and, uh, and, and obviously you can understand why at this particular point in time that our focus really has been so far on the region mm. because we see that as a very problematic uh, budget situation. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, and in their future, I assume that Dr. Z uh, at an upcoming elementary school committee meeting will be presenting projections for that. Um, okay, Dr. Z, Can did I you want to speak? Ahead. Yeah, please. Sorry, I had to run to the restroom. Um, and so um, we have started um, the budget process and we're laying out our projections for FY26. We're not complete as yet because we've halted to prep the region for um, the four towns meeting. What we have been doing right now is um, laying out all of our staffing and our concerns. One of the major concerns that we're looking at is as we plan for FY26, we're projecting out because we have to plan two for FY27. So we're trying to be very mindful of the new staff that we've brought in. Um, as well as what staffing needs we may have because of the projected consolidation. So as we, well, the consolidation of Fort River and Wildwood into the new Fort River for FY, for school year, I've been saying FY, for school year 2026, fiscal year 2027, sorry. So um, the conversation around the Amherst FY26 budget has begun. Um, we have started laying it out based on where we currently are we are going to have some curricular needs as we do our curricular audits. Um, so we realize that we have a few gaps in subject areas. So our supplies and, and where we lay it out operationally may shift. Um, and then we're also looking at when we would need to or what we would do in terms of sixth grade for the upcoming year, um, which would be on fifth, fiscal year 26. We know that Fort River does not have a lot of space and because of the programming of Caminantis, and the explorers, it causes for a larger sixth grade population than the school may or may not be able to hold. So we may have to shift um, programming in that sense. So um, we should be able to project out and final once we get through this week. Um, I think we have Amherst on our weekly budget meeting for next week with my team. So I think by mid-October, we should be prepared to project till FY26 for um, the Amherst Elementary. But those are the major things that we're looking at. Okay. Are there any other comments from school committee members about the elementary school budget? Okay. Then let's move to the library. We have Nat and we have Austin. Thank you, Lynn. So again, thank you for the opportunity to be part of the uh, part of the, the group uh, is very valuable to understand all the challenges the town faces. The library budget will, as always, be strained uh, by, you know, personnel needs and also by needs for programming. Uh, but that's something that we, we face every year. I have a question um, about the budgeting process. And I know I should understand this, but I'm I'm not really sure I do. So one model of a budgeting process is that entities like the library or the schools are invited to submit um, budget requests that reflect their real needs. Um, and then the town would deliberate about how it's going to meet those real needs. Another model of budgeting, which is the one I think the town um, um, uses is kind of here's what we can give you it's two and a half percent now fit, fit your budget to that that may be a very sound way of budgeting but in a way what it does is it keeps hidden what the real needs are so if the library or the schools or anybody else was to present a budget that showed a need for a six percent increase then we would all know what the things are that the, the those entities needed and if they couldn't be funded they couldn't be funded but then we'd at least have them on the table so uh i just want to make sure that that conversation is part of our conversation that if we if we budget to a two and a half percent increase uh we may not fully see what all the all the needs are though one can say 
that we're all here and we can talk about what those real needs. But from the point of view of the library, what I said before is uh, the case will will manage as we have in the past with the two and a half percent increase. There'll be some challenges in the operational budget associated with uh, the need to uh, have a temporary relocation. If we go to um, uh, an alternative site as we will when the renovation and expansion plan um, goes forward. Are there other comments, Matt? Hey, are there questions for the library? Okay, Paul, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to respond to um, Austin's. And he's absolutely right. There are two models. One is you say what you need and then see if you can fund it. The second is the model that the town of Amherst has always followed, which is you say, here's how much money we have. We do not have additional sources of revenue. We're restricted by prop two and a half and we share everything that we have out there. So we always start, we as a town start as a revenue model saying here about how much we have. How do you want to divide up the pie basically is what we say. And we have very limited ways to make that pie bigger. So um, we could do a zero based budgeting model where everybody starts at zero and people have to come and justify every dollar that they receive. Um, that's a well, way more complex and um, time consuming process, but it's certainly one that some communities or some areas do. Um, but I think, you know, the, the challenge for that is that there aren't, other than a proposition two and a half override, there aren't other major sources of revenue that can really address what the needs of our community are. So I agree with all, all that. My, um, my point was simply to surface something that I worry about year in and year out. And that is that we want to make sure that we, and again, I'm speaking now about the library and this is, but it's not particularly a library problem, are clear with everybody about what our real needs are that may not surface if we are budgeting to the two and a half percent. It can surface other ways. Uh, that That's my concern. I understand there are limited revenues, but you could still come, uh, you could still come to the understanding that we're only gonna give you two and a half percent. So it's, it's less about the budgeting model, Paul, than it is to just make sure that we are all being clear with the town and the, the citizens about what the real needs are. Um, Andy. Yeah, uh, having been involved in budgeting uh, in both forms of government in the last 20 years, uh, I think the one thing that uh, has to be recognized is that Austin is absolutely right uh, in that it doesn't deal with need. But um, the other part of that is that that's true of our town departments too. So that if Paul talks to uh, department heads in any one of the town departments, and we hear this at the finance committee, there is always, um, we, we really need more. And these are the things that we did not ask for because it doesn't fit within our budget. And, uh, you know, whether um, it's recreation or police or whoever, I mean, I think that um, I probably hear it from most departments and I would suspect that Paul even hears a lot more than finance committee does. Um, Councilor Haneke. Um, I was going to say some of the same thing that that Andy just said. Um, and in some sense, something I've been asking our town manager for a couple of years for is, I, I will say the schools are very good at discussing their needs versus what is available, um, particularly the region. <laughs> um, but, and it gets out there and the public knows that. But the library to some sense the elementary school but not as much um and the municipality aren't as good at doing that for whatever reason <laughs> um and i'm not placing blame on anyone but i think it 
it gives a potentially distorted picture as to how much the limited budget we have does it does restrict all four sectors of our town line um and is there a way and and maybe this is what Austin was going to how can we as a town better communicate to the residents that all four towns have the needs that they see so clearly from particularly the region, but also the elementary schools. Um, and and I I don't know, I, I'm not the one that presents a budget, right? <laughs> um, and, and maybe that's a discussion, if it was presented better, maybe there would be a different discussion here at BCG and at the council on how to um, distribute to the four sectors after all of the other sets of the um, expenditure side are done, capital, miscellaneous, and unappropriated uses, because those you can't really, for some of them, you can't really finesse them um, to lower numbers. Some of them are state mandated. Um, but we've operated on a two and a half. I know it's getting beyond, we haven't done municipality yet, Lynn, so sorry. Um, but okay. Um, maybe that's why these conversations, I've found them the last couple of years kind of stilted. Um, and maybe that's part of it is because we're not as elected officials seeing the full needs of the towns as well as we should be seen or could be seen and neither is the public. Melissa. Thanks, Lynn. I just wanted to um, address those concerns. I, um, you know, I'm new here and I'm not as familiar with Amherst's process um, as everyone else here. But um, one of the things that Paul asked me to do when I first got here was to meet with um, all of the departments to have that conversation about what are the needs versus um, what the budget, budget ask is so that we could start developing that conversation beyond um, the internal discussion, because I think that Paul is probably and Holly and Jennifer are very aware of the needs of the individual municipal departments um, internally. But um, to your point, I guess maybe not a lot of that is communicated. And I think that it's a bit of a cultural thing too for the municipal employees, because I got a lot of feedback from those department heads like, well, we don't want to make ways. It's not us versus them. We live within our means. We're being a team player. And I, you know, I had to share with them that, you know, you, you, you can't, you can't get what you don't ask for. And so if people don't know that, you know, your, your department has shrunk by 10%, that you're down staffing, um, then they don't know. So you have to at least make that statement. And I said that to them saying, and it probably won't change the outcome, but at least then it would be communicated. So to the best of our ability, I think that we're going to try and incorporate that kind of um, explanation about more about what services are provided and what services may or may not be lost by um, the fact that we are also constrained by revenue limitations. Okay. Bridget. Yeah, I appreciate what Austin said, and um, and I definitely also see that side that Melissa says, like, certainly, you know, as an Amherst resident, I feel strongly supportive of all the town employees, right? Like, I want the fire, et cetera, et cetera, to, um, you know, police, et cetera, to feel supported. But I do think it's an interesting question to think Townwide, if we're looking at a cut of 35 staff in the regional schools, is that more important? Like, is one detective more of a priority than two teachers or two firefighters? Some of those decisions are real decisions, too. And I think it's fair as a town for us to democratically mold them, if you know what I mean, even though you know, I don't want to see anyone go. If people are going, I think we really have to look very hard at our priorities. And there's also some baked in historical factors 
to the funding that we replicate in terms of historical inequities when we go up 2% each year. So you've got like X department maybe was highly prioritized on the federal level with certain funding. And so, but they're still going up at 2%. So they're doing really well where education, for example, we know was not. And even the historical issues of gender pay gaps where we know Amherst isn't doing well. And in large part, that's because teachers aren't well paid. So I don't know. I'm just thinking it's a, it's a really important question. I'm not sure what the solution is, but I'm glad Austin raised it. Irv. When we talk about needs, and if you're talking about a needs-based budgeting process, uh, when when it comes to the schools, uh, it's it's not only the staffing that we're talking about. It's a it's it's about what all of our students bring to the classroom on a day-to-day -day basis. Those needs that have to be met. Some of those needs are mandated to be met by state and federal gov government, i.e. special education. Uh, but more importantly, the needs that each individual student brings to the classroom, those needs cannot be ignored. We can't ignore them. There's no way for us to ignore the needs of that person in the classroom. We can't. No matter what we, we, we try to do, we cannot ignore those needs. So our needs, from my perspective, rises from a different place because we have to service individual students, kids, children every day. Every single day, those kids show up at our doors and they have needs and those needs are reflected in our budgeting process. And I, I just want, I mean, sometimes people say, well, you know, you're gonna live within your means. I mean, that's that, that's the kind of story that has been told to a, a lot of low-income people all the time. Live within your means. And what happens is that living within your means means that those kids go without. And that's not something that I think Amherst is willing to do. Melissa, you still have your hand up. Okay. Um, I'm going to save my comment. Uh, unless anybody has anything else to say about schools or library, we're going to go on to municipal. Um, I could start with my list, but I'm going to let other people start with theirs. Paul, do you want to start? Sure. So we can talk about the things that affect everybody first. Because you know we had a meeting yesterday that um, where we started talking about health insurance and what those projections increases look like, and they're it's an ugly picture. It affects us all, all of us, uh, all of our budgets, uh, and they're looking at ten to fifteen percent increases for health insurance. Um, you know we are we've talked with the schools. We're looking at probably trying to budget thirteen percent. Um, it's our sort of base number, and it's that's a devastating number. Um, last year, we got it under 10% by, uh, well, we got it under 10%. Um, and, you know, there's there's reason for it. We, we review the claims and all the things. So that's a, that's going to be, that's going to be a, a budget hurdle. That's going to be enormous. And it's going to, and it's, we have to provide insurance uh, to our, to our employees. The other thing is, we, you know, I think Holly and Melissa talked about the retirement assessment that had was near zero last year. We're projecting it to be average this year. It could come in above average if they try to make up. Um, so we don't know what that number is going to be. Jen said that we'll get that in January, but that number could be higher than what we have actually projected. So that's a that's a concern for us. That again affects all. All of the all the town employees, which includes the elementary school, the library, and the town, um, like the schools, our union, we have an unsettled one unsettled contract for firefighters, and we have the other contracts coming due in FY twenty six. So we'll be in negotiations with all of our unions this year. Um, again, those unsettled contracts, just like the schools, 
we don't know where those going to land uh, and whatever the agreement is we wind up with we're driven by what we can afford and we try to translate that to our collective bargaining units that um, it, it you know it, there's no there's no magic pot of money to be had it's just what we have um, and so you know and I think you know just to respond we you know Melissa's is talking to our departments about what their true needs are. You know, we've seen departments who have really um, had to pay for fuel costs, things that they're taking out of their budget, and they just stopped buying other things because of the needs. So we can we'll, we can begin to document all that. I don't know if it's a real benefit rather than just uh, my personal thing is you is I think we live within the what we're given and we work through that and. Uh, but I do think that politically it doesn't serve my employees very well, quite honestly. Um, Holly or Jen or Melissa, other concerns. Th th those were sort of general things. The collective bargaining things is, is more specific to the town, but it does include the, the um, library as well because they're collect they're bargained. Uh, they're part of our bargaining units. Did I miss it? We had, we had made Holly, what did we, Holly. What did we miss? Yeah, just one more thing is um, we actually, as well as meeting with um, our health insurance yesterday, we met with our property and casualty insurance company because um, our renewals are set for October 1st. And we have found that those prices as well, um, because of many, many, many reasons out there in the insurance field are increasing at approximately 15% as well. Um, granted, it's a much smaller number than our health insurance is, but it's it's more than the two and a half percent that we have in the entire pie. So it just keeps eating up pieces of the pie. So that's increasing by um, approximately 15 percent this year as well. And part of the driver of that is the general insurance marketplace, but also our, our experience. We're getting lots of claims, insurance claims, and I'm sure the region is having the exact same issue that we are. Yeah, absolutely. So the thing that keeps me up about the municipal budget is the same thing that many, each of you are kept up over. And it's our absolutely crumbling infrastructure. We have, if I hear about roads from my district one more time, I will just tell you it outweighs anything else I hear about. And the last figure I heard was probably two years ago, and that's 40 million. And that's not even talking about the sidewalks. And then on top of that, I'm so delighted we are building a new elementary school, but we have three other major capital projects on the books that have been on the books for as long as I've been involved in, in local government, which goes back to 19, uh, to 2015, 2005, I'm sorry, fire stations and DPWs. So that is what keeps me thinking about the budget. That does not even recognize the fact that I am sure that Melissa and Paul and other people in finance have heard the requests for at least four firefighters. They've heard the request for every department who have gone down. And then we get to the point that like the schools, we can't hire and fill some of our vacancies because we're not competitive in the marketplace anymore. So we're having some of those very same problems. I'm kind of like Paul, I live within my means, but I, I worry about these other things. And Andy, Joe, you can add to what you worry about. <laughs> so Lynn mentioned it last. I was going to talk about all of our empty positions and all of our major retirements and the fact that it took us an entire year to hire an inspector for our new rental registration program that is paid for out of fees. Um, we are having hard times from what I hear hiring and you have to wonder whether some of it is the pay rates that we can't raise, you know, as I, I appreciate Paul saying he tries to protect 
the staff and live within the means and not put it out there. But politically, I think it gives the wrong impression to our residents as to how the municipality is faring vis-a-vis -vis the schools um, in particular, but also the library, right? We all know that those increases are above two and a half percent on personnel and we're living within two and a half percent. And so just like the schools, we've frozen our, um, you know, our non-personnel expenditures. You look at that budget and most of that non-personnel operations is fairly frozen. Um, I look at our capital and worry that people will try to say, well, you can just decrease capital to increase operating, but then it puts us in the exact same spot we've been in for a decade when we did that to not fire people in 08 during the 08 recession. And that's been a disaster going forward. We, we can't afford, frankly, we cannot afford to decrease our capital allocation because it will just get worse and worse in the future and cost more and more. Um, I worry that we can't do what we need to do um, for the schools, for the municipality, for, you know, Irv talked about legal requirements at the state for the schools. There's legal requirements to pay stuff and do stuff for the municipality on the municipality size too. Um, I worry we can't continue where we are with the level of state aid we've gotten without asking for a proposition two and a half operating override. But all we hear is it's already unaffordable to live in Amherst. Okay. Um, those are the things that go through my mind that that there isn't money out there, but there's a whole lot of needs. And how do we split it up um, in an equitable way that serves all of our residents, all 40,000 of them? in the best way possible. Lynn didn't mention the demands we're hearing for other infrastructure projects of major building capital projects um, that we as counselors hear demands for all the time that I don't know how to fit it into a budget. And I'm not sure we can um, because it's just not going to be affordable for the kind of town that Amherst residents say out loud they want a town that is a wide range of economic levels, um, a wide diversity of cultures, um, but that requires property taxes to not, to be affordable for all, rents to be affordable for all, and that means we have to not necessarily go after two and a half, which means we have to find a way to live within our means, and I just don't know how. I muted because I didn't want to gasp. Uh, Andy, do you have anything you want to add? What keeps you awake at night? I think that uh, it's really been expressed by uh, everybody. And what keeps me awake at night is as is, is much thinking about the library and the schools as thinking about the town. Um, I think about all of the things we fund with the budget and I, you know, we questions sort of was came up is how did we ever come around to creating a formula where each of the operating budget segments gets the same increase each year? And I think it really came out of these town meeting days and the finance committee of the town meeting and just the realization that you didn't want to sit there at town meeting and have endless debates about who had the greater need. You needed to come up with a, a, with a formula, a method that would avoid that kind of a um, battle taking place. And the way that town that the finance committee came up with it was to say, let's just do the amount that was uh, equal across the equal across the board for each of the major segments, which is the four pieces that are represented here. And um, the other thing I just wanted to 
um, say as an observation at some point, and I'll say it now, so I don't have to ask to be recognized again, is that I was on the finance committee when uh, we made the recommendation to create the budget coordinating group. And I think that it was, uh, if I look back on decisions that I was involved in making in prior years, I think it was one of our best decisions because it has created a forum that allows us to have the kind of open dialogue that we have and to increase an understanding of the problems of each of the segments because we're always elected to look at one, but we want to look at the whole. And uh, I think that this uh, meeting today is evidence that uh, all those years ago, we made the right call. Right. So we don't want to end on a maudlin note. <laughs> we do have to approve some minutes, but uh, I'm going to call on Holly and other people. I I want to just, before I do Holly, is I want to add to what Andy just said. This is about the most frank conversation that we have across our three, four, if you will, branches of our government. And it doesn't, what I don't want people to go away with is suggesting for one moment that if you represent one branch, you don't value the other and the others. I mean, I spent seven years of my life as a public school teacher, so I certainly value education. Um, so it's, in, and I've you know, known to support the library and dread what will happen if we can't go forward. But um, it's, trying to put all this together in a way that, as Mandy Jo said, um, addresses what the 40,000 people who live in our town want and recognizes, by the way, that a good portion of those are students who don't even live here year round. But Holly. I'm, I'm reluctant to even say anything at this point, but um, one of the things that I just wanted to point out is that, you know, just that I agree there are some fundamental problems in the way that we can raise money as a municipality. Um, property taxes are high 60s, close to 70% of our revenues. We are bound by Proposition 2.5. New growth is the only thing that increases for us. And new growth is new buildings that were never on the tax rolls before. And that is obviously going to, at some point, be something that's not going to be sustainable um, any longer. And then the other part in the you know high teens, close to 20%, is state aid, which, once again, we have no control over. We can't say we're going to increase this by 5%, 6%, 10%. That those are property taxes between property taxes and state age aid. Last year, it was 88% of our revenue, things that we cannot control and we cannot get more money out of. They are, the, the calculations and the, the way that money comes in is nothing that we can control. So it there, there clearly are some some problems with the way that municipalities are are basically our hands are tied in in terms of making new revenue and it's it's very unfortunate um i personally and this is just a complete personal note is that i don't want to see people fighting over the money and when the town decided at some point, as Andy was saying, to just make it even for everybody. Um, seemed like a great idea at the time. Still seems like a good idea in my mind, but it is hurting the other folks. And it's not that nobody cares. It's just, it is the town's policy. So I just wanted to throw that out. Thank you. Councilor Haneke. Thank you. I, I wanted to make another comment on something that uh, 
Tillman talked about when he was talking about the region of the region had a 6% level services and state aid increases less than 6% a year. And so the towns are having to make up that difference, which requires to make up that difference more than 6% increases in town assessments. Um, I, and I wanna bring that to looking at the projections that we just had, um, because our state aid increase is 1.3% total within the full town budget revenue projections. Um, and property two and a half, prop, you know, our property tax revenues are, this one's 3.5 if you ignore the debt exclusion, um, which is an in-out one. Um, the town is also having to make up a lack of, a, a low state aid increase every year um, compared to the level services that the town has. Um, and in some sense, I, I guess I just want to recognize that the school is not alone in what seems like, to say it horribly, a death spiral down where it becomes impossible to make up year after year state aid increases of 1% when COLAs are 3 or 4% on the backs of the property owners in town. It it can't be done indefinitely, not for the schools, not for the town. And I think that's why we have these hard conversations here because we do have extremely hard choices to make. Um, and why I think I've always, even though the, the employees and Paul may not want it, I want to, I've always asked for more transparency on what the hard choices Paul has been making to show that it is not just the schools. Um, and we're all struggling with that without, and without state help, frankly, it will be, and it is just as bad for the municipality as it is for the schools. Um, because you just can't, you can't do it with, within our legal requirements without increasing the property taxes to the levels that we just can't afford. Um, I look forward to better, co more conversation about this now, um, cause, cause I think we're, we're potentially getting to the point where we're, we have to have those conversations and, and we're going to have to be very frank about what those choices are. Thank you. Austin. So I, again, appreciate the opportunity to do this and, and really grateful that we can come together. Um, I, I'm just worried that we are wedded to a budget model that is not responding to what we are seeing in front of us. What are we seeing in front of us? I just heard it described. I heard schools and problems in the schools and roads and town departments that are starving or that are not being able to fulfill their aspirations. Um, I'm not in favor of you know, budgeting as the war of all against all, but I wonder if we are doing the, the right thing by the town where we say you get your two and a half percent Others may need it more, but you're going to get your two and a half percent. Um, I just worry that we we're, we say this year in and year out, and there are all these unmet needs in the town, and they're not getting any less unmet, and they're not evenly distributed across the town. So an, a, a budget model that evenly distributes the little bit that we have, I don't know. It just um, I wonder whether it's um, it's responding to the, the needs which perceive, I perceive to be uneven, greater here and le lesser there. Are there any other comments at this time? We do need to approve, we need to agree that the minutes reflect without a vote. It's, a, it's not a um, required, if you will. Um, so there are two sets of minutes in your packet. Uh, I go by a rule that basically says, even if you weren't at a meeting, you can still vote. 
Some people don't feel comfortable doing that. Uh, but are there any corrections to either the February 16 or the April 5th minutes? Austin, you have your hand up, probably left from before. Nate, I mean, Nat, I'm sorry, Nat. No, I wasn't here for those meetings, but also I didn't receive a packet. So I will recuse myself, not because I wasn't there, but because I didn't see them. Okay. The packet is posted on the town's website. I'm sorry we didn't draw attention to that for all of you. Sorry. I, yeah, you I looked for it and town. I couldn't find it. Okay. You go to the town's website, you go to the calendar, and in the calendar, you click on the meeting that you're attending. And as you click on it, then you get a larger explanation, which includes the agenda. And at the very bottom, it says for materials related to the meeting, click here. And that is where the materials and the agendas are for meetings. I so, like, yeah, I should have done that before. Sorry about that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. We'll, we, we'll try to be much better about it in the future. Paul, you had your hand up. I was going to say, th say same thing as Thena just said, we'll send you a link. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Are there, any object, any changes to the minutes? And uh, if not, they'll just stand as the record of the meeting. Okay. I have a silly thing. I was listed twice as an attendee and on one meeting minute. I don't remember which one it is, but it's it's really Thank just you. a typo. You will make you sure been, that... you may have been extra that day. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> You may have been there in two different roles, which you were working for a while. How's that? For sure. <laughs> Jennifer LaFountain. Um, there is a comment about the dead the deadline for funding for the pension. It has um, Sandy and I responding that the deadline is 2036, but I believe it's 2032. So I just wanted to ask to have that corrected. Okay. Thank you. Are there any other changes people would think we should make. Okay, Holly, you still have your hand up, but that's probably because you were there in three different roles at one point. Um, so are there any concluding comments at this time? Besides the fact that we should keep meeting and keep talking. then I'm going to take a motion to adjourn. I, I make a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, we'll now just say aye if you agree with that. And after that, we adjourn. So I'll start with Andy Steinberg. He put his hand up. Uh, Nat Lynn. No, aye. Okay. Nat Larson. Aye. Austin Surratt. Aye. Bridget Hines. Aye. Councilor Lord. Aye. Sheriff Rhodes. Aye. Councilor Haneke. Aye. And I'm an aye. Thank you. We. This was a very good discussion. Thanks.